You're listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, where you get valuable information you just can't find anywhere else. To thrive in today's trying times, you need the Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and get your free newsletter and gift. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. And welcome. You are listening to Watching the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. We got our good friend with us now, Jerry Robinson, followthemoney.com. And uh, we're talking uh, this week about how the world is basically bankrupt. If you got a question, a comment, shoot me an email, kl at kerrylutz.com. How does the impending global bankruptcy affect you? Where does the world go to file a bankruptcy case? That's what I want to know, Jerry. Well, I think it's it, we, we're certainly in a, in a problematic time. Uh, there's no doubt about it. It's a, it's a time of our own making. It's a problem of our own making. We have uh, depended upon a system that clearly um, is leading us to a place where people cannot even afford basic sustenance, right? In many places. Uh, Carrie, you and I live in relatively, you know, uh, nice places. We live in a time and in a place where, you know, both of us have roofs over our head. We have food in our belly. We're not worried about where the next meal is coming from. But that's not the case for many people, not just here in the United States, which is shocking for some. But there's many places around the world that people are just living in absolute abject poverty and absolute misery. There's a lot of misery in the world. And those who live in the United States or even in some, you know, first world nations in Europe or other places in Asia, they they're not they're not familiar with this. They don't see this on a regular basis. And so the the, the problem is, is that, yes, we have a, a globe that is very disarticulated, very uh unequal, very, a lot of inequality. And the, the people who are doing okay right now uh, are doing okay at the peril of those who are not. It's, a, it's an unequal system. Now, Carrie, you and I didn't create the system. You and I didn't you know, come out of our mother's wombs and say, hey, let's create an unequal system that you know, rewards the, the wealthy and that screws the poor. You know, we didn't create the system. I wish uh, I had, we, but, uh, you know, <laughs> but we, we've come into it and we find ourselves here. And I think it's a dangerous time. It's a time when people who don't really know what's happening or probably are the ones who have the most at risk. Um, but it's a dangerous time. And of course, the book that we wrote, you know, many years ago, Bankruptcy of Our Nation, it's it's often comical when we when we actually wanted to call the book Bankruptcy of America and it was considered too risque back in this time, you know, back in 2007, 2008, you know, to say bankruptcy of America, that was considered to be too forward, I guess. You know, uh, it, it is a fact that the United States is bankrupt when you consider that what it uses for money. Now, people say, well, no, there's lots of value. I mean, look at how much value we have. Look at the net worth we have. Look, yeah, but what, but what, is, what is the denominating currency of all of that? You know, what have you based all of that on? And when you realize what we base it on, it's based upon paper. It's all paper wealth. Uh, not all of it. Clearly, there is some sticks. There are some bricks. There are some real things in our economy. But there's a lot more in the, in the form of derivatives and uh, high, highly financial, financially engineered products that will not survive in a time of real monetary meltdown. And so... Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is a dangerous time. And the way you the way you re respond to that is by having a diversified portfolio of many different things. Being nimble is the way to, you know, prosperity, I believe, in this crooked system. Yeah. Well, so basically, though, the globe is bankrupt. Uh, it started in the U.S. in 08 and 09. I mean, it's been building up for decades, but it started in 08 and 09. And it's gradually pretty much uh, a global phenomena. Every government is pretty much bankrupt, aren't they? Well, a lot of them are. Yeah, a lot of them are. And, and any of them that use the fiat currency systems and fractional reserve oh. banking, 
that they've they've clearly got themselves dug in a hole that uh, time will tell. But we're in a very unprecedented time, monetarily speaking, economically speaking. So we don't know how long the con can go on, but people are clearly realizing there's something very, very wrong with the global economy and even here with the U.S. economy. Uh, especially the dysfunctionality and it, you know, the dysfunctionality of the economy, Jerry, is, is flowing into dysfunctionality, family, schools, governments, every institution of society. I don't know which started first, the corruption of government and then uh, the corruption of all the institutions or what? I mean, you know, looking at WHO, looking at CDC, not even getting into the recent pandemic response and all that, but the fact that uh, members of the CDC are getting royalties from the very industry that they are purportedly holding accountable and regulating to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars over the past decade. It just came out. That's just one small example of it. But the corruption uh, seems to have spread like like cancer. It's a cancer on society. It's a cancer on the world. You're always going to have some corruption because you got politicians by their very nature spending other people's money. But now the corruption has become the end result, the end goal of the system rather than a byproduct of it. Oh, definitely. I mean, even here in the United States, like term limits would be a massive a uh, coup for the American people to actually have to hold these, you know, elected officials accountable where they just can't become career politicians and never, you know, have to go back out into the real world. I mean, that's just one example. But, you know, Carrie, let's think about 2022 where we are now. There's a lot of angst around what's happening in the economy right now. There's a lot of angst around the 9% official inflation rate. We know that it's higher real in real terms. Sure. But the thing is, is that we have to remember there's a lag factor. Now we have to go back to 2020 to fit. If you, if you want to know what's wrong with 2022, if you want to know how we got here, you have to go back to 2020. And of course, if you want to figure out what 2020 is about, you have to go back further than that. But the point is, is that 2020 is really the, the primary immediate source of the troubles that we're having in 2022. How so? Well, the way that this occurred was the fact that there was something called COVID and half of the country thinks it's fake. Half of the country thinks that the vaccine is going to kill you. Half the, half the country thinks that uh, this came from China. Half the country thinks that it's not. But ultimately, what we are dealing with here in 2022 is, is, a, re, is a result of the policy response that emerged in 2020. And so the policy response in 2020, Kerry, was to do what? Well, uh, ask, ask the people who think that, uh, that COVID-19 is fake. Ask them what they think about the government printing more money than it has printed in any year known to man in one single year to handle a fake uh, COVID-19 situation. Ask them what they think about that. Say, say OK, now you think the, uh, the, the disease is fake. And they just printed all this money to help this disease, which killed less than, say, 1% of the people. So they did all that when? Did they do that in 2022? No. Did they do that in 2021? No. They did this in 2020. So they handed out checks to everybody. They gave out a PPP uh, deal where 20% of it went to fraud. People were taking PPP loans. Uh, they were printing money like it was going out of style. They, they lowered z uh, interest rates to zero. And for all of those people, again, who said that the COVID is fake, they have a 2020 record here that shows that the government didn't think it was fake. And now what about the vaccine? You say, well, the vaccine is killing people, so we shouldn't promote the vaccine. Well, when was the vaccine created in 2022? No, it was created in 2020. It was created in 2020 by the Trump administration. It was green lighted and fast tracked by the Trump administration. And so the people who think that the vaccine is designed to kill people have to realize that it was created in 2020 and fast tracked in 2020. So 2022 is a function of the policy responses that we have in 2020. Uh, now, 
2023, 2024, 2025, those will be functions of what's happening in 2022, because there's a lag factor in things in the economics world. So it's a really bizarre time, Kerry, because, because we have all of this inflation that was literally created by the Federal Reserve in 2020, as they were, we all remember this. I mean, I think in the month of April 2020, more money was printed in that month than had been created for like a century beforehand. It was something outrageous. It was some crazy number, right? Why, Carrie, why did they print that much money? Well, ask the people who think the COVID is fake and they'll tell you they, they, they printed it to, to stave off a fake disease or ask the people. In other words, who thinks this response was, was legit? Now, as far as what I think about the COVID-19 situation and the vaccine, that's all irrelevant. I mean, it doesn't matter what I think, but we know that a lot what a lot of people think and a lot of people thought it was a fraud. And yet they're like, it's fine that the government printed all this money in 2020. They don't hold them accountable. They're like, we are, they're worried about what's happening now as if what's happening now created what's happening now. Like it, that's not how economics works. And so 2020, if you really want to get down and dirty and say what caused the current situation that we're in? You'll have to go back to 2020 to find uh, the beginnings of this. And when it ends, Carrie, we don't know how long this insanity will go. But here's what you can know. You can't have you can't expect to have unprecedented intervention into the economy without experiencing unprecedented consequences. And so in 2022, we are experiencing the unprecedented consequences of the unprecedented policies that were enacted and began in 2020. Yeah. So in effect, uh, you're going by the uh, guiding light of your website, which is follow the money, Mm -hmm. but you can't just follow it now. You got to go back in history, follow it when all of this started, right? Right. Exactly. An interesting way of looking at things. And the question is, uh, can you look ahead to 2024 and see what they're going to be doing then in 2026? Don't just survive, thrive. The Financial Survival Network. Gold Terra Resource Corp. is a gold exploration company that has assembled a highly prospective district-scale land position on the doorstep of the city of Yellowknife in Canada's Northwest Territories. Gold Terra is currently focused on expanding and delineating gold resources at the company's Yellowknife City Gold Project with a goal of discovering over 5 million ounces. With ready access to infrastructure and multiple high-grade gold discoveries, Gold Terra is on track to re-establishing Yellowknife as one of the premier gold mining districts in Canada. Gold Terra trades as YGT in Toronto and YGTFF on the OTC. For more information, go to goldterracorp.com. That's goldterracorp.com. This is the Financial Survival Network, the information you need to thrive now more than ever. Got to guess. I'll guess. Uh, I, my crystal ball is broken, but here's what I would suspect. <laughs> I, suspect that, I suspect that the roller coaster continues, Kerry. Mm-hmm. I suspect that what's going to happen is, is that we're going to reach that place that the Fed, of course, why is the Fed raising interest rates? And I should probably apologize for my lack of surprise or even lack of I- any, any kind of emotion at this government because they are, they've become so predictable. Uh, the roller coaster, I suspect, Kerry, is going to continue in the fact that the Fed is raising interest rates. Why? Well, they're raising interest rates because, A, they have to because of inflation. Uh, B, they're raising interest rates because it's one of the only levers they have. But C, they're raising interest rates because why? Because they want to be able to lower interest rates at some point in the future, because that's that's the power. That's like the lever that they have. And so if they can get rates up to three and a half, four percent, then they'll feel macho whenever the you know, then they can lower rates and be the hero. Right. And so it's a it's just literally a shell game. Uh, it's just going back and forth. And so when you see your 401k going down and going up or your balances and equities or gold and so whatever you're looking at, you see all these crazy wild swings in the balances of your accounts or, or your housing value or whatever. This is due to government intervention and. We've known this for a long time, but I would suspect going out to the future, the Fed's going to raise interest rates high enough to where then they can begin an aggressive rate 
uh, decrease campaign. You know, they're going to bring rates down. Right. And of course, this is the cycle where you'll get the next, you know, inflation of asset prices. And we'll go through probably a series of these for many more years, but it seems like they're getting more pronounced. The next time that the Fed has to step in to prop up the economy, it's probably going to take more than what, what they did in 2020, because the market will expect more. Um, right. They kind of create moral hazard by consistently moving in and doing what they do. So, so yeah, I think we're going to see more of the roller coaster ride. I don't think that we are sliding down into the abyss here. I think that we're going to, at some point, reach a bottom. The Fed's going to start its rate easing cycle and you're going to have the whole ride start over again and they're going to lower rates back down to zero as quick as they can that's their goal uh to keep goosing this market if they could lower interest rates to zero right now carrie you know they would you know they would you know exactly what they would do you know they would lower interest rates right now but they can't their, their hands are literally tied because their policy drove uh drove it to the situation and they were they told us carrie uh, Jerome Powell literally out of his own mouth said M2 money supply doesn't matter back in 2020. It doesn't matter. And he doesn't. Now, suddenly they realize that this, inf this inflation is real, that they create all this money. And now all of a sudden things cost more because they diluted the money supply. Well, of course it does. We already knew this, but, and you knew this and everybody, you know, we all knew this, but the point, and your listeners knew this, but the point is, is that the fed will now of course reach a place where they raise interest rates and then it'll slowly begin to go back down. That starts the whole rate easing cycle that begins to see asset prices rise. And we're already starting to get there uh, a little bit. Uh, you're already starting to see some investors start to say, these, these look like bargain prices. I'm not saying this is the low. I think that we uh, could have more legs down still, but I don't think that the Fed is going to, the Fed has already got a pretty, a uh, decent move now on rates. They're not too terribly far away from their goal. So they don't have to raise rates and leave them there forever. You know, they just have to pretend they, they have to get the American people believing that inflation is under control. And once they begin to see it peak, that'll probably be, you know, a bullish moment for some investors who will think, okay, now we can start investing. Will they be right? Will they be wrong? Will it be the bottom? I have no idea. But what I do know is that the Fed, once it's anxious to lower rates, it's trying to get there again. And I believe we'll see that cycle again. But it doesn't mean it's going to be good for anybody because these, this roller coaster ride is, is a dangerous place to be. This is where bad things can happen. And inflation, uh, mm. you know, they're claiming they want to control inflation. All right. We haven't really seen that much of an increase so far. Another 75 basis points coming. The markets are imploding. Uh, the market, well, they did implode. Uh, housing is down. Everything is down across the globe, largely as a result of this, or not so much as a result, probably was happening anyway, and it's coinciding with uh, rate increases. But uh, is inflation going to come down, Jerry? I think the official inflation rate is going to come down. I think it already has come down in some ways. I mean, remember, oil prices are well below their peaks. Uh, lumber prices are well below their peaks. Mm -hmm. Copper prices, gold prices, silver prices, uh, palladium. I mean, all of these are input costs. Uh, and so therefore, when the input costs come down, well, then the, you know, the inflation figures are going to come down. Um, so... I, uh, again, we may not be going back to a place where the official inflation rate is 2% anytime soon, but I think it all man, you're basically the Fed is managing expectations. So if it's 9% now, but it's a five and a half percent, you know, a, a six months from now, well, that's going to feel like a victory in some way uh, because it's come down. And so even though it's not good, it's not a good inflation rate going from worse, like from bad. It, whenever you have something really bad and it gets a little bit better, that is often where a lot of money is made. And so uh, I think we're going to reach that bad place. We're either there now or we're going to be there pretty soon. And then we're going to start going from that really worse or that bad place to slightly less bad. And that area is where investors won't want to miss. And that's going to be across the board in several, I would imagine, in several asset classes. 
and maybe that's the best we can hope for. You think yeah. the uh, the market has put in its uh, its lows for this cycle? We, uh, I the stock market in particular. Yeah, um, it's difficult to say. Again, no crystal ball. We called a long term downtrend on stock market, you know, a while back, and it shows no signs of of coming to an end. It's still. Yeah, all the rallies we've seen have been pretty much bear market rallies, shallow, shallow volume, followed by large volume legs down afterwards. So that's a classic bear market rally uh, is what we've been seeing. Um, however, uh, uh, you know, some some areas of the stock market, some sectors have been hit harder than others, and some have. Uh, fallen more sharply than others. And some of them have actually begun to heal or be showing signs of healing. So the market is, of course, composed of 11 different stock market sectors, and they're not all the same. But broadly speaking, the stock market itself, I don't think we've probably seen the the ultimate lows. But I would say that a lot of the pain has already been calculated in. Um, it's It's been, Kerry, yeah. uh, I have never seen the kind of uh, economic instability that we've seen over the last six to 12 months. I've, I have never witnessed it um, in all my life. And, and I would say that no one living since 1929 has seen anything, anything similar to what we're dealing with, uh, especially with the fact that we don't even know if we're out of the woods yet. In fact, there's no reason to think we're out of the woods. So this is a very, very difficult time for people. But the problem is, is that when you reach max pessimism, mm. the bottom is already was already in six months ago. So that's how the markets work. They're a voting machine. They they uh, they're usually forecasting six months in advance. So the market will tend to bottom stock market in particular. We're talking about the, the market will tend to bottom before people's pessimism bottoms. Yes. And so when the when the pessimism is just like all over the place, that's whenever a smart investor is saying, I'm looking for high quality uh, dividend paying companies that have you know pricing power, brand power, all that stuff. So that's when you're looking for those great opportunities. And I would say we're close to that. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I mean, I think we've been in a recession for the mm -hmm. past three quarters, because the GDP deflator is grossly underestimating the impact oh, sure. of inflation. Yeah. So when you factor in inflation, you could argue we've been in one for 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. But in reality, the past year or two, we've certainly been in one, uh, the crack up boom, putting that aside. So the question is the industries. So you like the dividend payers, the so-called dividend aristocrats, I mean, look, regardless of what the Fed does now, inflation's baked in the cake for several years ahead. Like you said, uh, look to 2020. Now look at 2022. Inflation is going to be with us regardless what happens uh, to these commodity prices, because a lot of the inputs and there's the inflationary expectations of the population as a whole expecting inflation to go higher, right? Yeah. Yeah. I would say, I mean, that's really the problem uh, for the Fed is the expectations of the people. That's and that's the problem with inflation in particular is that inflation can come down, but individual behavior, behavior may not change for a while. You go back and you study various instances of things like this, like the wake of the 1929 crash. If you look at the wake of the 2008 crash, you'll see that there is a lag factor in, in people's pessimism, their pessimism, you know, uh, trails the actual market, but also their, their expectations and their buying patterns will be affected for a longer period too. So the, the biggest danger, I think, from the inflation that we have now, aside from the fact that it's just ravaging our savings and ravaging our purchasing power, is the fact that you have, you have a Klingon effect where people are like, you know, it's 9% and they begin to get locked in that idea and they stop spending or they stop making decisions or they change their patterns. And those patterns may take a while to rechange again. And that's what the Fed doesn't want to have. It doesn't want people set in stone with 9% interest uh, inflation. They don't want people to start making decisions based upon that. So they're trying to bring it down. They're bringing it down by doing what? By raising interest rates. How does interest, how do, 
how do you bring down inflation by raising interest rates? Well, by raising interest rates, you suck money back into the system. And so by doing that, you lower, you actually deal with the underlying problem, which was too much money, too, too many dollars chasing too few goods. And so the raising of the interest rates suck that money back in, and it brings a lot of that excess cash out of the system so that you don't have too many dollars chasing too few goods. And they're raising those interest rates. They expect, and they've been wrong on so many things, but they expect to bring it be somewhere between three and 4% before they can believe it for two call it a peak. Some people believe that they're going to, they're going to make it to three to 4% and they're going to leave it there for a couple of months and then begin to lower them. Uh, the, the other case is, is that three or 4% interest rates will never put a dent in the current inflation that has been created. Um, Time will tell. The, the Fed has surprised me before. Uh, I remain open to seeing what's going to happen, but I, I know that in this environment, you have to remain defensive. You got to be very careful and be very smart. Agreed. Agreed. Well, I think we covered a lot of ground here, mm -hmm. Terry. I tend to agree with you uh, about a lot of what you said. Uh, the only way that three, four percent rates really put inflation to bed is if. Uh, it really sets a, off a deflationary cycle and the system is so fragile now, maybe that's all it takes at this particular point in time. Whereas back in the good old uh, 70s, early 80s, Volcker raised rates to 20% and it took that to break it. Uh, if we see credit creation go down, money supplies start to shrink then perhaps they're right. But I'm a little bit more skeptical because I think there's a lot of cash out there that was created that's sitting on the sidelines. Oh, there's a lot. For the opportunity that you uh, discussed. Hey, mm -hmm. so Jerry, uh, we find you at followthemoney.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you got a question for Jerry, known each other for years already. I mean, going on 10 years, Jerry. That's Just wild. Email. Yeah, I believe yeah. that. Shoot me an email, kl at kerrylutz.com. We'll get you an answer. If you go to the site, financialsurvivalnetwork.com, make sure you sign up for your free newsletter. Jerry, always a pleasure. Thanks so much for stopping by. It's great to be here. Thanks for the invite. Take care. Thanks for listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, your solution to today's trying times. For the latest, go to financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever.